Order. We will now move on to questions to the Minister of Education. Can I inform members that questions 4 and 11 have been withdrawn? And I call Mrs. Sandra Overlen. Mrs. Overlen. Question number one, please. Uh, Mr. Speaker, with your permission, I will answer questions 1, 2, 3, and 6 together. My department's draft 1516 resource budget outcome has resulted in a funding gap of £162.5 million, which represents an 8.4 reduction from the 1415 baseline. Clearly, achieving reductions of this scale within one year is extremely challenging, and maintaining all core services at current levels is simply not deliverable. In reaching my decision on the proposed budget reductions and the inescapable prices to be funded, I have focused on protecting frontline services as far as possible. Hence, the reduction to the aggregated schools budget is 7 per cent and not 8.4 per cent, and this is reduced further to 6 per cent when the additional 10 million set aside for targeting social need, which I propose to allocate next year, is also included. Unfortunately, as the aggregated school budget represents 59 per cent of the total education budget, it has simply not been possible to protect it fully from the reductions. I recognise that early communication was vital, which is why letters issued to all schools on the 2nd of December, providing the indicative aggregated schools budget and illustrative per pupil funding values for next year. Our focus and my focus remains on raising standards and improving outcomes. However, clearly the situation is very difficult. This is why I will endeavour to do all that I can to make the case for increased investment in education as part of the 15-16 final budget negotiations. Thomas is over and for supplement. Thank you very much, Mr. Deputy Speaker, um, and I thank the Minister for, for that response. Um, since, since the proposals were announced, I've been inundated with, uh, from schools in Mid Ulster um, with how, uh, explaining how these cuts will have such a dramatic effect on the delivery of education in Mid Ulster. And the, the Minister does need to recognise that this, this cut means mass redundancies, uh, larger class numbers less specialty provision and a poor quality environment for education. Uh, the ASB amounts, as he said, to 59 per cent of the budget. Um, does he not recognise that he must look for efficiencies in the other 41 per cent of his budget? Uh, thank the member for that supplementary. However, if I was to look for 162 million in the remaining 41 per cent, then the member would be asking me questions about as to why the boards are facing such dramatic reduction in their services, transport, special educational needs, free school meals entitlement, school meals, uh, youth services, uh, Sure Start would face a re greater reduction than it's currently facing, so, and, the list, and the list would go on. There is no easy answer in relation to the difficulties facing the education budget. Um, I have endeavoured to maintain the schools budget to the best level that I can. I am working with and engaging with the Finance Minister in relation to the final budget outcome, and I hope to be able to secure additional funds for education. And if I do secure additional funds for education, the majority of that will go into schools. Well, Mr Declan Michaelier for supplementary. Uh, does the Minister agree that for education to succeed in the classroom, it is also important to invest outside the classroom in areas such as uh, extended schools and youth services? Um, without a doubt, and um, before lunch break and after question time, we will continue the debate sponsored by some members of the House in relation to funding. And I think the mistake and the flaw in the, in the motion is that it simply concentrates on schools. 80% of a child's learning takes place outside the school. Um, the impact of the socio-economic background of the child impacts on its educational outcomes within the school. So we have to deal with all aspects of the child's life and we have to deal with all aspects of how a child or a young person engages in education. So simply focusing on funding for schools will not make for a successful education system. And we are an education system rather than simply a schools based education system. Mr Alban McGuinness. Uh, uh, thank you, Deputy Speaker. And could I thank the Minister for his detailed reply? And I hear what the Minister says. But if the minister looks at the situation in most schools, 90% of schools, their money goes on staffing. 10% is left for other things. Given the severity of the cuts, how can schools reasonably avoid uh, cuts uh, in their staffing levels? It is absolutely impossible, minister. I'd ask you to respond to that. 
I have never suggested that schools will not face uh, reductions in school staff, whether it be teachers or support staff. And, uh, my officials have been open and frank about this from day one, and one of them was referred to as being cavalier, which I think was unfair at the Education Committee. Um, the, the, my officials and I have been out front from day one saying that the education budget will result in a significant number of losses of teachers, support staff and other staff from the boards and other support organisations as well. As I said, the only solution uh, to, well, the long-term solution to our problems is a change of government in Westminster and one that has, has an economic policy which meets the needs of all the citizens rather than those corporate businesses that operate out of the south of England. However, but the, the short-term solution to our problem in terms of education is that education receives an uplift uh, as a result of the final budget outcome, and I can assure members that the majority of any uplift I receive will go into schools. Call Mr. Patsy McGlone. Um, just further to that, could we have some detail around um, the projects that the Minister intends delivering within the constituency, please, particularly those capital projects? Um, I'm not, well, I'm not sure in terms of how this relates to this question. I think Mr. McGlow may be referring to a later question, uh, and I'm happy to respond to it at that stage. Well, Mr. Chris Little. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Uh, can I ask the Minister uh, to confirm that he is proposing a 100% reduction to the Community Relations Equality and Diversity in Education budget for 2015? And to ask him what impact he thinks that would have on schools' ability to, uh, uh, to contribute to improve community relations in Northern Ireland? As a, as a result of what is an extremely difficult uh, budget, um, I'm having to look at ways in terms of how services are deliver, delivered alternatively. We are looking at a significant investment in shared education programmes over the next number of years, up to £25 million being delivered across shared education programmes. And I would hope that in terms of, of a CRED policy or the CRED policy could be delivered through the shared education programme. However, as a result of a quality screening of the budget, one of the areas that has been flagged up for a fully quality screening has been my proposal to um, fully remove the CRED funding, and I'm particularly taking uh, a more detailed look at that proposal, and will make a final judgment on it based on all the evidence, including the equality screening, um, when I announce the Department's final budget. I call Mr Mickey Brady for a question. Okay, question five. In 2013, at my request, the NA Anti-Bullying Forum undertook a review of anti-bullying legislation, guidance and practice. The review made a number of recommendations which were being taken forward as part of an agreed joint work programme for DE and the Forum. It highlighted the need for greater consistency in how all schools are tackling the issue. We know some schools are making considerable efforts in this regard, but the review noted wide variations in the anti-bullying policies and procedures of individual schools and a lack of detailed information on the true scale and nature of the problem across all schools. A key recommendation was therefore to bring forward legislation to address these weaknesses and help ensure all schools understand and are using best practice to tackle bullying and support pupils. For this reason, on the 23rd of June, I announced my intention to introduce new anti-bullying legislation in the current Assembly mandate. A public consultation has been launched on the 5th of January and will run until the 27th of February. Following this, it is my intention to introduce a bill to the Assembly in May 2015. This is a challenging timescale, but one IMA officials are working hard to meet. Mr Brady, for supplement. I thank the Minister for his answer. Could the Minister please outline the scope of the proposed legislation within schools? Uh, the proposed legislation will provide a common definition of bullying, require all schools to centrally record incidents of bullying, their motivation and their outcome, and require boards of governors to identify and designate one or more members to be responsible for anti-bullying policies and processes within uh, its school. Paul, Mrs. Dolores Kelly for supplementary. Uh, thank you, Deputy Speaker. Uh, Minister, could I ask how you can ensure consistency of application across different schools? I'm sure you're aware in your own constituency uh, that different school governor boards do apply it with the current policies and procedures uh, on a much different basis than, than you and I would both understand. So will there be a supplementary guidance notes to the legislation how it should be applied? 
Well, one of the reasons why I, I asked for the review of our current policies was because, as a constituency MLA and indeed as a minister, I have regular reports of concerns by parents and pupils about how bullying cases are dealt with in, in schools. And you hear some harrowing stories, I have to say. Now, and there are also many, many fine examples of where schools have acted appropriately and have acted uh, in, in the best interests of all involved in the bullying cases and sought resolution and helped uh, all the young people involved. However, uh, I think it is important that we bring forward the legislation. The legislation will define as to how uh, and what incidents and how they should be recorded and how policy should be outlined and supplementary guidance, etc., will be provided to schools to ensure that everyone is familiar with and trained in as to how anti-bullying legislation should be implemented in schools. Mr. Roy begs for supplementary. Thank you, De Deputy Speaker. Uh, I would welcome the uh, consultation on anti-bullying legislation uh, to protect our children and young people. Um, but uh, would the minister advise, does he not find it rather ironic that he, a Sinn Féin minister, is leading this, given that of recent times uh, his party supporters and indeed some of their elected representatives have been involved in cyberbullying of Anne Travers and Maria Cahill? And not only that, his party's past history of actual physical violence. I, I think the member belittles himself by making that comment. The member is steeped in education. The member knows education as well as I do, or many other members in this chamber does, and he could come forward in this debate with a much more informed question, a much more informed intervention than he just has. And I don't know if your party management or who put that question in front of you, but you should have more sense than to read it out. Well, Mr. Nelson McCausland. Thanks, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Um, in regard to cyberbullying, one of the um, issues there is that it has been highlighted quite a lot in the press in recent days. Um, could the Minister tell us what ideas uh, there are being considered in order to give schools some guidance in dealing with that? Well, the, the definition of bullying uh, will include the use of uh, cyberbullying. However, we also work with the Health Department, who are preparing more detailed uh, information in relation to the Department has also endorsed proposals by the Health Department for the Safeguarding Board here uh, to develop an e-safety strategy. We would expect this work to include consideration of cyberbullying in all forms and all settings. We will want to work with them to ensure our own work and that of the forum is both informed and aligned uh, by, the safety, by the safety board. So we are working with, with other departments in relation to this matter, but in terms of the definition, which I hope to bring forward in legislation, it will also cover cyber, the use of cyberbullying as well. Well, Mr. Ian McRae for a question. Question seven, please. Uh, in my January 2013 capital programme, three schools in Mid Ulster were announced to advance in planning Holy Trinity College, Kirkstown, Gale Scully Neil, Coal Island, and Eden Dork Primary School, Dungannon. A development proposal to increase the approved enrolment at Holy Trinity College, Cookstown, has been submitted to my department for consideration. The economic appraisal for the new school cannot be completed until a decision on the DP has been made. Work on this project is pro progressing in parallel with the DP process, with regular project meetings taking place to ensure momentum is attained. The EA for Gail Scully Neil has recently been submitted to my department for consideration. The project will progress to, this, uh, to the design stage when the EA has been approved. With respect to Eden Dork Primary School, which is ongoing to appoint the design team, when this has been completed, work will commence on the feasibility study and the business case for the new school build. In February 2014, four schools in Mid Ulster were included in the school enhancement programme. These were Rainey Endowed, Macrofelt, Anna Horish Primary School, Townbridge, St Mary's Grammar School, Macrofelt, St Joseph's Grammar School, Dannockmore. Site work on the Rainey project commenced in September 14, with the project estimated to be completed in January 2016. Design work for the three other projects is an advanced stage. Mr McCree for supplementary. Thank you, um, Deputy Speaker. The Minister <coughs> will, will not be surprised that I um, will ask him um, a question in respect of the, the Rainey um, endowed. As the Minister will know, um, not only from his visit but from no doubt discussions within his department, the Rainey endowed has been in um, the system for quite some time. 
And whilst I do accept that the um, Schools Enhancement Programme funding will at least um, help the school um, address some of the, the difficulties, will the Minister um, still give an assurance that he will do what he can to find the funding to try to um, assure that a new build is, is given to the school? Um, all applications for new build will be taken into consideration, uh, and the merits of each application will be measured against um, uh, the process at that time. Rooney and Dowd have been successful in the, in the School Enhancement Programme. Work has already commenced. I had a brief conversation about the works on the fringes of another meeting with the principal, uh, and he's invited me down to the school to uh, take a look at how work is advancing, and no doubt lobby me about other investment as well, as is his right. Uh, but uh, I look forward to undertaking that visit. I will listen both to your concerns and, and, and the school's concerns about the fabric of the school, and we will do everything in our power to uh, advance capital bills in that school and many, many other schools that are deserving of new bills across the north. Mr. Patsy McGlone, for something. Um, uh, I guess we have a um, question. Thanks very much to the Minister for his comprehensive uh, statement. And I also could place on record my thanks to his officials for their help, particularly with St. Joseph Dunnock Moore, and for the Rene Endowed Macher Felt, I um, have to put that on record, to be very efficient in those. Um, could the Minister give us some indication as to progress being made? He mentioned Eden Dork earlier there, but progress been made in regard to Holy Family Primary School in Macher Felt? Uh, I am aware that Holy Family Primary School is and has been seeking a new build for a considerable number of years. However, I cannot match the number of schools that are deserving of a new build against the capital project I have, and I have to bring in, I've had to bring in a scoring matrix uh, to try and provide fairness throughout the system. I have put all the new builds or proposals for new builds through that scoring matrix, and those who score highest, and though, uh, I can match money against, I have provided for a new build. That does not mean that uh, other schools are not deserving of a new build. It simply means I do not have the required capital at this stage uh, to build them, but I continue to seek further funds. Um, from all quarters in relation to building programmes for our schools, and hopefully uh, through time uh, this school will be successful as well. Well, Mr. Sander, over end for sub. Thank you very much, uh, Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister uh, for, for the detail. Um, the Minister mentioned uh, the capital project for Holy Trinity in Cookstown, and um, I just wonder could the Minister provide an update on the, the de development uh, plan in, in that area? and. Uh, how the growth of that school might impact on other schools in the area, and maybe if, if the minister could acknowledge um, any difficulties um, of area planning in the area because of the the, uh, the change in, in board area. Do you know? Can answer that question. Um, as with any development proposal, particularly a significant change in terms of of school character or, or enrolment numbers, there will be different views among key stakeholders in the area, and I have received representations from two, both sides of the argument in relation to this, that DP. I will make uh, my decision in due course, taking on board all relevant information that has been provided to me, the meetings I have, I have engaged with in relation to that matter, and uh, ensure the member that when my decision is reached, it will be based on all information uh, which has been brought to my attention. Well, Mr David Hillage for a question. Question, yeah, Mr. Speaker. Uh, following an intensive uh, process, I published a very detailed draft budget for 2015-16 consultation document on Wednesday, 26 November 14. In reaching my decisions on both the inescapable prices to be funded and my proposed reductions, I focused on protecting frontline services as far as possible, promoting equality and raising education standards. I secured the contribution of specific programmes that reflect the department's statutory responsibilities. I continue to tackle social disadvantage and ensure that support for children with special educational needs is prioritised as much as possible. I have no further update other than I will endeavour to do all that I can to make the case for increased investment in education as part of the 15-16 final budget negotiations. Mr. Hildage for supplement. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and thank the Minister for his answer. Clearly, like all our MLAs, there's, there's been strong representations about concerns and fears from local schools. How is the situation being communi communicated to educationalist unions, etc.? Um, I, I met with uh, the unions uh, early on in this process, and I outlined to them, in very stark terms, uh, the education budget 
what the possible implications of that would be. Uh, they responded in a very robust manner uh, in defence of both education and of their members. Uh, and they have, as we were, holding a number of public, well attended public meetings uh, across the North, outlining to uh, teachers, parents, and community and, and politicians what the implications of the draft budget will be if there is no significant change to that. Um, I have, as I said in an earlier question, we have corresponded with all schools. We have set out the indicative budgets for them. Schools have been responding. The Education and Library Boards have been responding in relation to how they feel uh, the, the budget will impact upon them. And 21,000 responses have been received to date uh, to the education budget. So there has been a quite uh, a healthy and robust exchange of views in relation to the draft education budget. Call Mr. Sean Roger. Mr. Speaker, previously, Minister, um, small schools had some budgetary pr protection. Uh, but in this draft budget, the smaller rural schools will be adversely affected. How do you intend to address this issue? Uh, the, the draft budget I have published has not made any comment in relation to the small schools element excuse me, of the aggregated schools budget. Uh, so the small schools budget continues uh, into the future unless there is a consultation to change it. Call Mr Jim Allister. In pursuit of his austerity cuts, uh, has the Minister given any thought to the dramatic impact on a school which has made a two-year commitment to deliver a course to parents and to pupils, and then suddenly is told that in foot of cuts as savage as this, they have to make huge savings, which could result in the withdrawal of that course offer or the withdrawal of the staff to teach it? Has the Minister thought through the long-term consequences of these severe cuts that he's proposing. Well, I am glad that Comrade Jim has now joined the fight against austerity uh, measures. You, you, you're, you're, you, you, you are very welcome, if not very, 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 very late to the cause. But it, it's always good to have a new comrade on board. So it is. Uh, in, relation to, in relation to your question, um, I am acutely aware of the pressures being placed upon our education system by the budget we now face. And our education system in its totality, whether it be schools, whether it be youth services, whether it be extended schools, whether it be breakfast clubs, whether it be free school meals and entitlement, all those things that go to make an education system are under pressure. I am engaging with my executive colleagues and the finance minister on a way forward. I am, like every other minister, have no doubt scrutinised um, all the changes that have happened since the draft budget was announced, including uh, the autumn statement, uh, which was made by the Westminster Government, which seen around £70 million of borne consequentials come this way. We are looking at other areas, in, in terms, including the £30 million change fund, which was in the draft budget. I have made applications to that uh, as well. We are looking at other areas as a consequence of the Stormont House Agreement, which the member uh, was opposed to before the ink dried on the page. So I am looking at all areas for additional funding uh, for education, and I hope the member, Comrade Jim, supports me in that. <laughs> please, I would just uh, caution members to address people by their proper name. I would also suggest that the minister perhaps would make his remarks through the chair. And finally, I would ask Mr Alistair not to be making remarks from a senator to position. I call Mr. Chris Hazard. Well, then, thank the Minister for his answer thus far. The, the Minister's outlined there has been tens of thousands of responses to the consultation. Perhaps he give an outline of what type of responses these were. Um, well, m m many have been reflected in the Chamber this afternoon, both during question time and through uh, the, the debate, which is, is ongoing. Members, are, and members of the public, teachers, parents, and pupils are significantly concerned about the impact on schools. I have had representations from youth service, youth workers, people who use youth services. Uh, I have uh, contacts and, and representations from Sure Start projects who are concerned. I have had representations in relation to the CREAD policy, which was mentioned uh, earlier in the Chamber as well. So across the whole gambit of educational services, uh, members of the public uh, and uh, users of those services have responded. And um, we are now going through those in detail. And as I say, I'm taking into account those comments, comments of, of, of MLAs, uh, the debate today, before I make any final decision in relation to my budget. And I hope, uh, with fingers crossed, that there is an uplift for the education budget. And 
I, I recognise the pressure on schools. A significant amount of money will go to schools, but there are also other services there uh, that require an uplift as well. Well, Mr. Leslie Cree. Be speaker, the Minister will know that special needs are non-core issues, but despite that, Mr. Um, Minister, uh, have you any plans to protect special needs children in schools despite the budget cuts? Um, one, one of the pressures I have recognised in relation to my budget is at least £10 million of pressures uh, which are reflected from our education boards in 14-15, which we managed to cover. I have included that in my estimates for 15-16, so there is a reflection in the budget, and one of the pressures on my budget has been the diversion of £10 million towards the boards for special education needs. However, <coughs> I would say to members that that may not be enough. There are rising special educational needs requirements and applications for special educational needs and identification of special educational needs, which bring with them uh, additional costs. And we may have to identify further funds in the 15-16 financial year for special educational needs as well. Mr. Stephen Agnew is not in his place. I call Mr. Sean Lynch. Mr. Lynch. Question 10. Uh, my department does not have responsibility for the development of Irish language, as this is the responsibility of the Department of Culture, Arts and Le Leisure. However, in my statement to the Assembly on the 4th of November, I outlined a vision for the strategic development of Irish medium education based on creating educationally sound post-primary provision, which enhances the significant benefit provided through the medium of the Irish language. The granting of the development proposal for a school in Dungiven will assist in filling a gap in the strategic development of Irish medium post-primary provision. In particular, the, the pupils will benefit from a totally immersion experience in the Irish language through the formal instruction of all curricular areas and socially in corridors, dining halls, libraries, etc. Uh, the development of our, the Irish language in the area will also benefit from the fact that there will be a shared whole school community identity, ethos and culture and a shared understanding of the philosophy of the Irish medium education. Mr Lynch for supplement. I welcome the decision and ask would the Minister outline now that the development proposals have been passed, what are the next steps? Thank the Member for the question. Uh, officials from my department met with the school representatives uh, on the 18th of December 14 to discuss the infrastructure needs of the schools. There are a number of steps that need to be taken in relation to the business case process uh, to procure the site and accommodation. In relation to the site, the next step is to complete a feasibility study in relation to procurement of accommodation. A schedule of accommodation needs to be finalised prior to the completion and approval of the business case. It is anticipated that a further meeting will take place towards the end of this month to discuss progress on all these matters. Well, Mr. Dominic Bradley for a supplementary. Um, thank you very much, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Uh, and I thank the, thank the Minister for his answer. Could I ask the Minister, um, does he see any further potential for the development of Irish medium education at post-primary level? Well, as I, I outlined in my statement of November when I was uh, launching um, the report by the advisory group, we were seeing a growth in Bunskulna on pupils attending primary school or primary School for Irish Medium Sector. So there, as a matter of fact, and that as a result of that, we're going to see an increase in demand in post-primary provision. Um, I am expecting development proposals to come in from other areas, and they will be treated as any other development proposals. And as I mentioned in a previous question, there's always those who are here for or against in terms of a debate around a development proposal and its impact on an area and its possibility of success. But I, I will make decisions based on the evidence before me uh, and on the best interests of all the peoples involved. Call Mr George Robison. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker. Mr Speaker, could I ask the Minister what additional capital investment is going into other post primary schools in the Lima, Lima Valley and Dungiven area? Minister, can you be brief? <laughs> well I would be very brief. I don't have the information in front of me, but I'm happy to supply it to the member.
Or that ends the period for listed questions. So we may now move on to topical questions, and I call Mr. Cahill Boylan. Mr. Boylan. Yes, I can call you. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. But could I ask the minister to outline what opportunities the recent Stormont uh, Agreement creates for his department? Well, I, I think the political stability provided by uh, the Stormont House Agreement is an advantage to our entire society and allows politicians to concentrate on the delivery uh, of public services uh, in very, very difficult uh, financial climate. But, however, as a result of the Stormont House Agreement and a united approach by the, the political parties in the Stormont House uh, discussions, we have managed to secure additional funding uh, for usage by the executive. In particular, I would highlight again the £500 million that has been set aside over 10 years for, for usage in shared education and integrated education projects in terms of capital investment. Mr. Boylan, for a supplement. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. I'm going to thank the Minister for his uh, reply. But could I ask the Minister, just in relation to the shared education, how can that process uh, benefit from the recent agreement? Uh, the Member will be aware uh, from previous answers during this session that I have launched a shared education uh, policy and indeed shared education legislation which I, for consultation, which I then propose to bring before the House to put on, put on legislation what the de definition of shared education is, which will allow us then, in terms of the Education Authority, which already has a clause on it in relation to the facilitation and promotion of a shared education, it will allow the uh, Education Authority to carry out its work. We now have funds to uh, literally build upon that work and build facilities in relation to shared education campuses, shared education facilities for schools uh, going into the future. So, we have significant investment here for both integrated and shared education going into the future. Mr. Samuel Gardner for topical Thank you, Mr. Question. Deputy Speaker, may I ask what steps is the Minister taking to adjust the school's curriculum to prepare pupils for the pattern of employment likely to exist in 10 years' time? Um, our curriculum allows flexibility, and flexibility is built within it to allow schools to adapt and respond to the varying challenges uh, within society, within the economy, etc. Now, I accept it is quite difficult to forecast 10 years ahead what jobs are likely to be available, because if we look back 10 years and look at the jobs that are now available, many of them were unheard of in terms of the skills required, uh, the background required, etc. Et but we can make a, a reasonably firm prediction, and I said this at the recent uh, BT Young Scientists competition in Dublin, uh, that if you have a firm bearing of STEM subjects, then you have an opportunity to adapt both into the future in relation to whatever career pathways you choose or whatever career pathways may open up into the future. Mr Gardner, for a supplementary. I thank the Minister thus far. Recently, Oxford University research showed that half of all occupations existing today will be redundant by 2025. What advice has the Minister sought on this matter, <coughs> and what action does he propose to take? Well, I, I, as I've said already, our revised curriculum allows for an adoption, both in terms of a skills base and an academia base, uh, to prepare young people for the future. The emphasis of the executive and indeed work, collaborative work between myself and the Dell Minister has um, raised the profile of the STEM subjects like never before. And I would encourage any young person who is looking at educational pathways at this stage to embed themselves in the STEM subjects. If you embed yourself in the STEM subjects, you are adaptable and have the skills base which current employers and future employers are looking for in the future. Now, I, I, I have been recently asked the question uh, uh, through, this, through the uh, last can call you through the Deputy Speaker as in relation to what, when will I review uh, the curriculum. I don't, I don't believe the time is right to review the curriculum, but I think whoever the next Education Minister uh, will be, that one of their earlier ta early tasks in their portfolio will be to review the curriculum to ensure that it is still flexible and adaptable to the changes in the, in the economy. Mrs. Pam Cameron for a topical question. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Uh, can I ask the Minister what support he's giving to early literacy interventions? Um, well, the, the best support we can give is in, through our investment in early years, uh, our investment in preschool places uh, for all those uh, pupils and parents who want to have those and embed them in literacy and that. I have also launched uh, 
the an advertising campaign. The first two years of that concentrated on the home, concentrating on the, the use of parents, grandparents and guardians, and the simple practice of reading stories. Uh, to their children at bedtime, reading to their numeracy and counting with their children uh, in, in different aspects and making that aspect of learning fun and enjoyable. I would like to have further funds to invest in projects, but as has been debated widely here in this last 45 minutes, the education budget is restricted. But there are ways parents and guardians can, from a very, very early age, encourage their children to read and to count. Well, Mrs. Cameron for supplementary. Thank you, and thank you, Minister, for that response. Um, I have to say I was very disappointed um, to discover that Book Trust are having 100% of their funding um, removed in the draft budget. And given that the excellent work they, they do, and um, as you have outlined, actually, the importance of um, parents and grandparents reading their children, and there's obviously research to, to show that all children do better at school if their parents read to them. So given um, the tremendous work that Book Trust um, actually do, will the Minister reconsider the removal of that 100% funding to Book, Book Trust? Um, I, I too am. Uh, it's difficult to make decisions in relation to aspects of the budget, particularly, and these aren't significantly large budget lines. And so you ask yourself the question, if I cut it by 10 or 15%, am I making an impact which is going to make it undeliverable, or should I just cut the whole budget? Uh, and go down that road. I am going to reconsider Bookstart. I cannot make any promises at this time. It will depend on the final budget settlement, um, but I am aware, and as I was when I signed off on it, that there would be concern about that matter, because I, I had concerns about it myself, uh, but I will revisit. Mr. Paul Girvin for a topical question. Uh, Minister, in relation to uh, the breakdown of your budget, it's who sets the priorities of where that money is spent? And what input have you in that? I have full input and take full responsibility for it. At the end of the day, it's the minister's responsibility to set the priorities within his department and then match uh, his budget uh, as best as he can against those priorities. Mr. Gervin, for supplementary. Thank the minister for for his answer. Uh, it's just uh, I, uh, previous answers alluded to that 80 percent of the uh, time education was not necessarily in the classroom uh, and I appreciate that uh, other areas were identified as where spend was. When did it become a statutory responsibility of the Department of Education to provide breakfast where I think it should be the parents' responsibility? Um, well, I suspect the majority, if not all the parents in this room, are responsible to do that and have the whereabouts to do that, have the finances to do that and have had the experience in their own lives to do that. But unfortunately, we don't live in a perfect world. And it is not a statutory obligation of the Department of Education to carry out a significant number of functions we carry out. But um, when the evidence shows that funding initiatives outside the classroom benefit the teaching inside the classroom, then I think it's only right and proper that we do that. And the 80% of learning outside the classroom is not in a formal setting, or may not be in a formal setting, it may be through the experiences of the child in the family home. Now, that can be positive or it can be negative. Uh, and it also may be the experiences of them in the local sports club, experiences in the local youth centre or, or church group or boys brigade or girls brigade or scouts, wherever it may be. So all those things play a part in enabling a young person or a child to fulfil their full potential. Uh, could I inform members, please, that question five was withdrawn, as was question eight. I call Mr. Marchin O'Mullier. Colonel Mahir, I'll ask Kian Corley. When I'm cast to Coronara, I'm going to ask you 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 to well, or in case. Thank the member for the question. Um, the member will be aware that in uh, September 2013, I approved, or sorry, I approved for September 2013 the increase of numbers of pupils attending St. Edith's Primary School in Carryduff. That was as a result of a development proposal which came forward from CCMS. I am aware that there is concern, uh, in, in, in particularly in that area of the South Belfast constituency, that numbers are growing and that and they won't be met. 
CCMS have a statutory responsibility to bring forward proposals, if they believe that to be the case, which will ensure that there will be places for all children who require them uh, in education moving forward. The uh, Education Library Board, uh, in terms of, I think you're on the border of Belfast Board and also FELB, so the two boards that are working together will have to bring forward proposals if they believe there's a requirement for an increase in numbers and the Education Authority in the future will have to also do that. The member is most likely aware that I've also improved enrolment of Millennium Integrated Primary School carried off and there is also a current development proposal uh, with my department in relation to increasing the enrolment at Forge Integrated Primary School in Bel South Belfast as well, which I, I have not yet made a decision on. Mr. Miller, for supplementary. Gurum I will ask on Corley I was talking about his foster than Iris as the flagration. I really just ask the Minister would he continue to monitor this. There are really positive things happening. I suppose we call that outer South Belfast or carried off. It's really a, a beacon, I think, for the way we'd like community to develop. It's really important there are enough primary school places to let that community prosper. Uh, I, I will continue to monitor the situation and through the area planning. And there's, a, there's an ideal opportunity for all the sectors to work together in relation to planning a sustainable schools estate uh, in Carried Off for South Belfast or indeed across the entire north. But I am aware of the concerns that have been raised previously by members of the public and elected representatives, uh, and I will again raise the matter with the two authorities responsible, CCMS and uh, the two boards at this, this case, to ensure that they have plans afoot to deal with these matters. Mr Jerry Kelly is not in his place. I call Mr Alban McGuinness. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker. And, um, I know the Minister has referred throughout question time to the cuts and so forth, uh, and <coughs> principally in relation to uh, schools. But in relation to the youth service, I would ask the Minister to give his assessment in relation to the youth service. And the reason I do so is I represent an inner city uh, constituency, a large part of its inner city, and the youth service is a very important contribution to assisting uh, with social problems uh, and even post-educational problems in the uh, constituency. Could the minister give his assessment? Well, uh, my assessment of the youth service is, uh, is that it is an integral part of our education system, that if the youth service uh, is succeeding in creating opportunities and delivering opportunities for young people to improve and to change their lives dramatically, particularly in areas of high social deprivation. During my time as Minister, I have increased funding to youth services. It was with, however, a heavy heart that I was in a position to reduce funding as part of the draft budget. It is one of the areas I am monitoring uh, in relation to any uplift uh, in budget for the education system. And if I have an uplift for the education system, then as I said earlier, it's an integral part of our education system, and I will be endeavouring to give youth services uh, some of the money back as well. Mr. McGuinness, for supplement. Uh, could I thank the Minister for uh, his response? Uh, but could the Minister assure the Assembly that when it comes to the reallocation of funding in relation to youth services, uh, that he will play, pay particular attention to inner city areas uh, where the uh, beneficial effect of youth service is most felt? Well, um, I, I have in the past uh, delegated funding to boards for youth services on, on, the, on the basis that they're used in areas of social deprivation. Um, I keep that situation under review and um, regardless of the outcome of the final budget, I will still insist that any uplift that was given previously is used in areas of social deprivation. But I do want to be in a position uh, to correct some of the £3 million that have been lost to various youth organisations and youth services as a result of the draft budget in the final budget, and I would expect uh, that that money is directed to where it is most needed. Order. Time is up.